So Father's Day. I kind of kind of stuck, tried to work wrap my mind around preaching for Father's Day. And uh, many of you know that I coach football. And I kind of like him being a dad to being a, an offensive lineman. That's what I coach. And I, I found this little thing here. Maybe you can relate this to, to being a dad. This says the offensive lineman. As an offensive lineman, the second you decide to put your hand in the dirt, you made, the, you made a choice. A choice to toil away in anonymity. A choice to be the first to be blamed when something goes wrong and the last to be praised when something goes right. A choice to get rid of any ego you may have and show up every week to work. You give <clears throat> up stars and glory and stats for purpose. For the, the, I don't have to read this right. <clears throat> you give up stars, the glory, the stats for the personal knowledge and knowing that without you, the team has no chance of success. That without you, the quarterback can't throw touchdowns, a running back can't gain yards, a wide receiver won't have a chance to catch a ball. You understand that no one cares about a lineman unless he's doing something wrong. You are taught to be violent, but to be a protector, to play nasty, but to retreat when the time is calls for it. You must have a uh, take no prisoners mentality. You must go into the game knowing that despite who lines up against you, no one is tougher or meaner or better than you. Understand that when you strap on the helmet you put your, and you put your hands on, in the dirt, may God help the man across from you, for you will show no mercy. And when the game is over, win or lose, you will remain humble. Physicality, toughness, and pr a protective nature lie within the great, all great linemen. When you choose to place your hand in the dirt, you become the least known, yet most important unit of the team. Understand that and come to practice um, every day to work, ready to fight, ready to make a difference it takes to win the next game because playing on the line separates the men from the boys. Not all are able to play in the trenches but those who are, they will never be broken. As dads, we don't always get seen. They don't always know where we are. We go away and we do our job and we work hard for our family. And so I just wanted to, uh, to give a little encouragement and to, to just give a few tips Basically, what I've got here is just eight tips of being a good dad. And uh, for those of you who are, who are dads, you will recognize them. For those of you who are, aren't, who are not, you might see them being your dad. But um, I don't want to come across as uh, preaching down to anybody because I'm not a good dad. <coughs> Lord knows i got a lot to learn yet. But these are some things that I've kind of learned along the way that have been really, really helpful. I want to start off in Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 5, 26, 25, 5, 25 and 26, chapter 6, verse 4. And then we're going to skip over to Proverbs. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 reads, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might be, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water and of the word. And then six, chapter four. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then Proverbs chapter twenty-two, twenty-six. Twenty-two six, not twenty-two twenty-six. 
Train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So, eight things, eight tips. First of all, love the Lord. We recognize that God is our Father, that He is the first and greatest Father, and that we are all His children. And then he calls us through adoption to be his children and to call on him as our Father. The first and greatest commandment when Jesus was asked was to love the Lord your God and serve him only. So that's the first challenge. In your own personal walk and in your own personal life as a dad is to love the Lord. Number two, Love your wife. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Your closest neighbor as a dad is your wife. She's sleeping in the bed next to you. And you have to love her. It's just the way it works. And not only do you have to love her, but you have to let your kids know that you love her. I get to tell stories out of school because my parents are here. <laughs> I remember very vividly going into the kitchen growing up and having to get my parents to move because they were making out in the kitchen and I needed, and I needed the peanut butter. <laughs> and they were right in front of the peanut butter jar and where the peanut butter was stored. And I get, and then they'd have to move back so I could get to the cutlery drawer and they wouldn't let go of each other. I knew that my dad loved my wife. They made it obvious. No, not my wife. But his wife. Well, he loves my wife. I knew that my dad loved his wife. It was very, very obvious. And sometimes when my kids would misbehave and they were treating Donna the way that I didn't think they should, should treat Donna, I would look at them and I'd say, I don't care how you treat your mother, but don't you dare treat my girlfriend that way. <laughs> because your wife holds a special place in your life. And you know, if the two of you aren't working together, parenthood is hell. You have to have a plan. You have to work together. You have to love one another because that's what carries you through the bad times. So love the Lord, love your wife, and then love your kids. And that sounds obvious, but... Um, Sometimes I see parents nowadays and they're treating their kids as their friend. They want to be buddy-buddy, they want to be with them, they want, they want to have that kind of friendship relationship. You can't do that. I learned it from my dad. He was my dad until I got into high school, uh, until I graduated from high school and we spent the year working together. And we traveled all over the place. It was 1980. It was, I graduated in 81. So how do you feel what happened in 81? The National Energy Program, the NEP, the first Trudeau put in place. There were people in Calgary jumping off of high rise windows, uh, high rises because they'd lost everything overnight. I graduated from high school and there was no work. And my dad, I think, was, was had just quit with World with World Book and we were we were we were just working wherever we could find work. We painted, dad had bees, we did I remember digging we we, had, we dug a trench one day, uh, with sandy soil, but I think we dug dug a hundred and hundred feet of trench for a water line. And we just did whatever could be found to do for work. We managed to keep bread on the table in the house over our heads. But that's when our relationship changed from father-son to friendship. We became each other's best friends at that point. But not before that. Because while your kids are still growing up, you got to be a parent. you got to love them enough to be their parent. To hold the standards, to hold their, their feet to the fire when the time comes and to discipline when they need to be disciplined. So love your kids enough to be their parent till the 
time comes that you can be different. And then you've got a whole, a whole adult life when the relationship can change and you can be buddy-buddy, but not before. So love the Lord your God, love your wife, love your kids, and know your kids. Ah, uh, when we were first parents, there, 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 uh, there's this, we were reading, there was this test, I can't remember how, all the details of it, but one of the things that was for, you know, for young married couples that didn't have kids, and one of the things you were supposed to do when you were prepare, preparing for parenthood was to take a, an octopus and put it in a mesh bag and try and keep all the tentacles in. <laughs> Uh, the other one was to uh, to walk down a hallway uh, filled with glass and tacks in the dark and not yell when you stepped on something. <laughs> that was to simulate trying to get to the kids' room without making noise by stepping on Lego and all those kinds of stuff. <laughs> the other thing that you were supposed to do was sit down with uh, friends of yours that have, have kids and tell them how to parent their children. <laughs> <laughs> because it was the last time you were going to actually know anything. <laughs> And, and so what are you, you know, you, you need to know your children. Each one of them is uniquely different. When we went to start potty training, we figured we, with our oldest, and now I can just tell stories. <laughs> Whoops. I'm uh, making a mess. Timber. worth dying on. We can maneuver around this a little bit 
There were some hills that we would we would go to war and that would be it and there would be no moving past that point, but there were other hills where, you know what, that's not worth the battle because with four boys, you'd be fighting all day long. It just wouldn't be worth it. You'd bang your head against the wall. So love them. Love the Lord, love your wife, love your kids, know your kids, stick to the principles, and learn to apply them in an appropriate manner, and then discipline with love. One of the things that we, we learned early on is that if we were going to discipline, if we were going to spank our kids, and we spanked our kids, we didn't care what the government said, we spanked our kids, but we never spanked our kids without hugging them and holding them afterwards. We never spanked our kids without hugging them and holding them afterwards. And we tried never to spank our kids in anger. My sister had a great method. She wouldn't spank her kids in public, but if they were messing around in, in the grocery store, she knew exactly where to get a little hold of a little skin and give a little pinch. <laughs> She knew how to get their attention. You have to discipline your kids. If you spank them, it won't kill them. But it might if you don't. And that's a, how do you say, a transliteration from Proverbs. But if kids don't have discipline, they just lose it. So, Going from top to bottom, number one, love the Lord. Number two, love your wife. Number three, love your kids. Number four, know your kids. Number five, stick to the principles. Number six, discipline and love. Number seven, promote in independence by allowing positive rebellion. What do I mean? Well, as your kids get older, they get more mature. And as they get more mature, they're able to, to do more things, right? I, I used to laugh. We, we like to watch the Big Bang Theory and Howard, his mom was still cutting his meat for him, right? And we're like, that's something that you do for a five-year-old. And, he had, and his, his girlfriend watched his mother cutting his meat, meat for him. And she said, Is, are you, when we get married, are you going to still let your mother cut your meat for you? He said, no, you can cut it for me. <laughs> and I'm like, and the irony, you know, it's just, it's hilarious. But it's sad because when they have to grow up and they have to slowly take over responsibilities. Donna has MS, and, and so mobility is an issue. We used to have the laundry down in the basement. So Ruben got frustrated with the fact that Donna didn't get the laundry up and down fast enough, so he started doing it himself. That's positive rebellion. So then Trent started doing his own laundry, and we decided, well, if the youngest two can do their own laundry, then the oldest two can do their own laundry as well. <laughs> And we taught them how to move, do the laundry, and then I actually moved the laundry upstairs, and they still had to do their own laundry. <laughs> but there are things that as they grow older, they're going to start to rebel a little bit, and you need to give them a little more responsibility. We used to tell our kids, you know, once the eaglets get big enough, the parents kick them out. And you know how they kick them out? They tear the nest apart. So there's no place for them to stay anymore. They have to fly away. <laughs> the goal of parenthood is to get them out. <laughs> and so it takes time. So they have to learn to take on that responsibility. And the way you know they're ready for that responsibility is they start to rebel a little bit and push back. And they say, okay, what are we doing here? That We need to give them a little bit more leash. You don't want to give them so much leash that they're going to hang themselves on it. You just want to give them enough so that they, they start to get the feel for it. They take their own, on their own responsibility. Um, this guitar. This one right here. I was in high school. I had a job. I made my own money. I used to work at a metal art mall as a, as a janitor at night. And I decided that I'd been playing the guitar since I was in grade 10. It was a great call. Now it's time to get a new guitar. So I went to Giovanni's and I bought this guitar and I paid six hundred and fifty dollars for it in 1981 or something like that. And my mom went, "Well, I'm not so comfortable with you spending so much money on that kind of uh, on an instrument. But if you really like it, you can buy it." 
I said, good, because I'm going to buy it. <laughs> you take on responsibilities. Turns out now, now, now it's been a long time. <laughs> Forty some years that I've owned this guitar. Doing some research on it, I discovered that it's a very rare and highly sat off so sought after guitar and the retail value of, to resell it now is well over twenty five hundred dollars. So I did make a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to allow our kids the ability to take on responsibility and we know that they're ready for that by the way they kind of start rebelling a little bit. They start to kick at the goats and then you start to like, feed that out so that they take on more responsibility all the time. And eventually they're driving off in their car, which they paid for and they're covering their insurance for. Because <laughs> we wouldn't buy our kids a car either. Go, what could we have? No, when you can buy one and pay for the insurance, you can have a car. <laughs> it kept them out of a lot of parties. <laughs> so, Going over really quickly again. Number one, love the Lord. Number two, love your wife. Number three, love your kids. Number four, know your kids. Number five, stick to the principles. Number six, discipline and love. Number seven, promote independence by allowing positive re re uh, rebellion to happen. And number eight, be there. Your kids might not want you to tell them where to go and tell them what to do or whatever, but they want you there. Get to their games, get to their recitals, show them that they are important. Even when they're 55 years old and you're waiting for them to come to the service. <laughs> it still means something. Be there. We promised our kids, I promised them I got I had coached high school football after high school and then we got involved in St. Paul when we moved here and I said, as long as you guys want to play football, I'll be there. And we made the time to be there. Just a, a little anecdote, Trent went on to play for the University of Alberta. We tried to make as many of those games as we could. Then they went on and, and Ruben and Trent both played for the Huskies. And Ruben went, uh, Trent went through that positive rebellion where he said, you know, I don't want to play ball anymore. I'm not going to make I'm not going to make the CFL, it's not going to happen, and I'm done. And I said, well, can you play one more year with Ruben at the Huskies level? And he said, yeah, okay. So he did. And now the, in the U of A, he couldn't get on the field and playing for the Huskies. He couldn't get off the field. But it was time for Ruben, for Trent to be done. And Dale and I jumped in the car. His last game was a playoff game in Calgary at McMahon Stadium. And they lost by like two or three points. Had they won, they would have been to go on to the semifinals against the Hilltops. And I, I remember watching Trent walk off the field. I'm standing in the stands and I looked down and I could see him there. I was pretty much by himself in my own mind. But I stood there <laughs> and I yelled as, at the top of my lungs. I said, Trent, I'm proud of you. And he looked up at this from the from the playing field and he said, Thanks, Dad. <laughs> and then I yelled, Trent, I love you. <laughs> and he yelled back, I love you too, Dad. And that was his last game. It's the last time he played football. But I was there. Be there for your kids. When they're little, when they're adults, there are certain things that are going to prevent you from being able to be there. But as much as you can, be there as a dad because you love them. It says more than anything you can ever say is just to be there. So, Recap again. Number one, love the Lord. Number two, love your wife. Number three, love your kids. And number four, know your kids. Number five, stick to the principles. Number six, discipline and love. Number seven, promote independence by allowing positive rebellion. And number eight, 
be there. So we're going to wrap this up. I wrote a song for my dad. It's called My Father's Hands. And we're going to sing it for you. My son Leonard is going to play the bass. <laughs> I sent this to my dad. And this was written uh, March the 14th. I sent a copy of it to my dad as a poem, and then again as a, uh, an mp3, but they could never figure out how to play it. <laughs> so I had to go sing it to him. But Dad said, well, when you do it in the leg, I want to be there. And so they're here. <laughs> and I'll try and get through it without crying. <laughs> this is called My Father's Hands. Is those hands that love me?